Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm going to talk about how we at Tomra work through the chip shortage that is that hopefully had happened, but it's still happening. Probably just a new normal, I guess. Yeah, for those of us who don't know what Tomra is, we make reverse vending machines. In Norwegian, it's called Pante Machiner. What we essentially do, we take these bottles and then you get money back. <laughs> it's the whole concept was the, the stores, the grocery stores in Norway, here in Norway, they have a responsibility to accept back all the empty drinking containers. So here in Norway, we, when we buy one of the one of these, hopefully with something in it, you also pay a deposit, and when you return these to the stores, you get that deposit back. It's the whole goal is to prevent a lot of uh, littering and to get all the material back in a controlled fashion and not just laying around in nature. So the concept was the stores found it to be too much manual work. Sometimes people came with like garbage cans, garbage bags full of like beer bottles 50 years ago. Beer bottles was glass and that was quite heavy. <laughs> And all these grocery stores wanted something to automate this process. So our founders 50 years ago, the Planke brothers, they invented the hole in the wall, where essentially you go to the machine, you place your bottles in the hole in the wall, and then you get the receipt back with how much money you are owed from the grocery store. And then you go to the checkout and you get that money back. So here we see one of those customers. He's a very good boy. Uh, not all of our customers are such good boys, but hopefully someday. Uh, so we have quite a lot of different kind of machines. And in order to have a large configuration of machines, we have decided to build them up from common modules, more some more common than others, of course. So examples are like, we have a component for, that handles a specific stepper motor or a BLDC motor. We have some IO expander boards. We have uh, an infeed, like we have belts that when you put in a container, it feeds through the machines and stuff. We have power box, we have miscellaneous LED displays, so we get all these kind of machines. So we have from small machines that are completely standalone uh, to larger ones. These are one of our newest babies that we like very much, we, we, where the concept is you open a big hatch, you take your big bag of empty containers like bottles and cans and you just pour it in close the lid and just wait until it's counted up for you so you don't have to manually do one by one by one very helpful and the customer seems to be very happy <laughs> when my both my mother was happy that they got one in their town and my grandmother was very happy yeah. and like okay this is something that people start to notice these kind of things has been very common in the Norwegian stores in yeah, like the last 40 years, perhaps. Uh, but we also, due to having these kind of modules, have started to create like huge uh, centers that are more for uh, trained personnel that can count huge amounts, like thousands and thousands of bottles and sort them correctly. Say this one goes back to Coca-Cola, this one goes to shredding, this one is glass and that goes back to destruction and everything. So we have 
quite a big array. They're all from like these huge to configurable size backrooms. We call these ones backrooms because you have the front end in the front and then you have a backroom in the back, like <laughs> before the wall and back of the wall. Some of these can be pretty large. Uh, the big one up top right in the middle, they can be like nine cabinets long. And then it's, that's for very large uh, grocery stores that handles huge volumes. An example of this is like on the Norway-Sweden border. There is quite a lot of shopping for, let's call them cheap <laughs> can, uh, sodas and stuff. And some of these machines with like the hugest backroom, they go as lo all, all day. Like from the moment the store opens, people are feeding them containers and they just work. Well, like thousands and thousands of bottles each day. So yeah, we, we usually sh uh, split it up in the front end and back end, you know, back room thingy. The front end usually handles like recognition, like figuring out this is actually a bottle and not a teddy bear or something else. We had eggs and sandals and chocolate bars and everything through our machines. During, when we tested the big one, that was weird. We got like, I think we got scissors, we got yeah a shoe, we got a half a teddy bear, I think, uh, a hard boiled egg. That was fun. Uh, <laughs> so we get some uh, fun challenges when you say, hey, here's your bag, just throw it in. Then like, there will be some weirdness up in. So the front just recognizes and says, this is okay, this is not okay. Figured out how much to refund. Handle all the people that want to cheat. Like attaching like a fishing line on the end and us pointing in, just yanking it out. Don't worry, we detect it. You don't need to try. <laughs> um, these kinds of things. Um, I mean, in the in the back, the back rooms are responsible for like sorting, the, doing the aluminium cans to one com compactor and the pet bowls like this to another. And when one of the bins go full, you go to the next one. Those kind of things. So we make things, actual physical things. Uh, and short business lessons, if we cannot make things, the income stops, and that's bad. Do I get an MBA now? Okay. Uh, business has a sell thing, get money more, in, more money in than out. So, like, one and a half years ago, things started to get hard to find a supply for. So not only just these that we are, we've, many of us have heard about like chips and electrical components are hard to get, but also metal got harder to get, got pricier and like physical buttons and plastic was also kind of hard to get for a while. And a lot of these things you can easily find replacements for like a metal sheet a sheet of metal is more or less exchangeable with another sheet of metal. But replacements for microcontrollers are trickier because they are more, yeah, they do more stuff and they are intelligent beings, not, not, not beings yet, but you know. So currently we need about 100,000 microcontrollers a year, roughly. Uh, and when we have those kind of volumes, we have to coordinate with suppliers very closely to have a guarantee that we get the supply when we need it and we have enough so that we can create the machines that the stores are waiting for. But as the supply gets worse, the price usually goes up. Uh, but there comes a point when the supply actually stops and then it doesn't matter how much it costs because you can't get any. <laughs> so the price essentially goes to infinity. 
So then you're in a pretty bad place because you cannot actually physically get the component at all. You can't even buy your way out. So a way through. I say we started to get really worried about one and a half years ago in the winter of 2021, January, February, those around there. And then we, they started uh, to really look for alternatives, find other suppliers for a bunch of stuff, uh, tried all they could to keep engineering out of the decision. Uh, all praise to them. Uh, they do fantastic work <laughs> in the sourcing and supply. Uh, but then it came a point where they say, this is, we are too worried about getting enough components, especially the microchips. The prices are doubling, they are tripling, they are five doubling, they are 10 times the price suddenly. They get, they got extremely, extremely expensive. So then it was, decision was made that this is untenable. We need a different strategy. We need to fix this in another way. Can't buy ourselves out. So the plan more or less was you find a different microcontroller. So, but the thing is you have to find one that's similar enough. And then you get you think about the capabilities you need and stuff. So that's all well and good, but then you have to design that microcontroller onto the existing circuit boards and all the pinouts are always different. Like, generally speaking, they are different. Pin compatible is usually just pin compatible on paper. <laughs> there are always some gremlins. It's just, just a reality, I guess. So we design copies of the current boards. We duplicate everything, basically. And then we have to change the code so that it supports both the current and the new one at the same time. Because then we have an alternative for the sourcing and the manufacturing of the play. And then the interesting one, we have to make the new models work just like the old ones. And then that, that's... <laughs> as always, the tricky one, or another tricky thing. So, as I said, we had 100,000 microcontrollers, but they are not all on the same module. So we do the most needed modules first. Here is roughly the distribution of our uh, microcontrollers and the different boards, non-labeled because <laughs> business sensitive, I guess. So some of the modules are used by many different things. And those are the one on the far left on the screen here. And the idea is to just work your way left to right. <laughs> and take the one you have the need, most need for or use it the most, use those. This should be fairly, expand, fairly straightforward. But a, a consequence of this is that the development for the next board reduces always when you go downwards because you have if you start with the one on the left you have a lot of things you have to change in order to make it work but then you can take some of it over to the next next one because they probably use the sort of the same thing like the it uses the uart it has a command line it has peripherals controlling and then some boards have analog to digital converters that they use and then if you use if you implement that far left and then you, you need it on the more to the right then it's free, essentially. So uh, the one on the furthest left is this one. I think it's this one. We have now three of these. They look the same. You can exchange them in the machines. Just take an old one out, put a new one in, and it still works. So this is a circuit board with controlling a motor, <laughs> essentially. It, it, it just a stepper assembly, a stepper module that we wrap in a box. And then we can use that in different kind of back rooms, different kind of machines. And some of the things it does is it communicates over CAN to the main machine. 
the main front end, the controlling part of the, the entire system. The primary purpose is the motor with positioning, uh, absolute positioning. But it also has a few digital inputs and outputs and an analog input. So having it be just a motor would be, would be fine. But having a few extra inputs and outputs <laughs> always helps. <laughs> Like you can suddenly use it for like a button, or you can use it to flash some lights to uh, guide the attention of the staff in the stores. And so, yeah. Uh, so the usage of this is like roughly a third of all our microcontrollers that we need are used in this, this module. <laughs> so here it is attached to a flap on the back room and we have uh, bottles going on the conveyor here, and then this flap here would guide some objects on uh, bottles into this chamber here, which then would drop them down in a compactor, which crunches the bottle down to something more manageable size. So it doesn't, so it isn't just air, like a lot of this is just air. We can use it to use it for other things. We have one of the things we have is for primarily for heavy glass bottles. You don't want to just drop them in a bin, then it probably uh, shatters. But we have uh, some that can carefully place them down on a table and then it's you have it standing up. And part of the mechanism for putting the guiding the bottle off the conveyor and down on the on the table have a motor, motor that kind of half grabs the bottle. So that you need the positioning and this stepper module used both places. Perfectly fine. So we, we had this one and we needed a copy. Uh, we needed a copy fast, uh, but it has to work just like before. Like, okay. This is kind of tricky. It shouldn't be, but as always, you probably will hit all the shortcuts you have already taken. Like you skipped some documentation, you skipped some features, you you have some implicit knowledge in the guy who left, the guy who, or the person who left. Sorry. So, but we are kind of on a deadline, right? <laughs> Because if we fail now, we basically cannot fail. Because if we did, if we cannot create one of these, then the production stops. And at best, we have to put all our uh, assemblers on administrative leave. At worst, we have to fire them, and that's not good. So we have to go steady. We have to be pretty sure we <laughs> make it actually replaceable. So our initial knowledge is like this. It's used in several machines and back rooms, perfectly fine. Uh, we do have production checkouts and all these physical dimensions and everything. Uh, we have uh, documented the protocol that it communicates on, on Canvas. Uh, it's proprietary, but we still have like the interface description and everything. It's well documented. We have some documented behavior. Uh, because usually you say that the requirements are for a complete machine. You don't always bother to do full specifications and requirements for individual modules of the bigger system. So we need something slightly more rigid, more proper, more maintainable, more documented. We need basically we need more confidence that when we have to do something, we doesn't. One, we keep it, keep the current working as it always have, and the new ones working like the current. So we devise itself some safety nets, we create the safety nets, hopefully the race are documented knowledge and verify that it still works on all complete machines. Uh, primarily we do this with tests. We have the low levels one on the top, of course, uh, unit tests, we have module tests, we have system tests, and we have market tests. So this is probably not controversial, but 
module tests can also be argued to be some kind of integration tests, but it's when you start to use these words, you get slightly fuzzy, uh, and people use slightly different meaning for the same words. <laughs> we can't even figure out what a unit means. Anyone have it? <laughs> Unit can be like tiny or it can be big or you can even call this a unit if you want. So things are get well it'd be what it be. So we try to set ourselves up for success and have these kind of safety nets more layers of safety nets. So we cannot of course rule out balls, but we hopefully catch a lot of them. Uh, the system tests are Pretty okay. We have a bunch of machines in the labs. They are mostly manual tests, like you have an actual tester. We are lucky to have a separate department that do testing and verification. Uh, mostly manual tests, like they set up the machine in some particular way, feed it some bottles, see that it works, or like they yoink the doors at the wrong time and see that it falls back and it rejects the items you want and that it responds to errors and a lot of these things. You can check, you easily check like a lot of the common configurations out in the markets. You can also check some un uncommon configurations. Usually they use uh, like hot built or alpha release software. So you can have, give me the software that is on main now and let's test that out. So we have in total, like we have a lot of machines, but then we took some of them and dedicated it to this project. Market tests you know, are when you go out in the fields, you agree with some store owners that, hey, can we borrow your machine for like a month? And they say, uh, okay, <laughs> kind of, and say, oh yeah, we'll, we'll give you some slightly better service or something, but it's a... Uh, someone else not me <laughs> agrees with the stores that these are okay uh, we explicitly run bay uh, a separate release for these kind of, of tests a beta release usually and for this one we only used the refactored for, uh, firmware for the new uh, modules because then we know that we cannot break the existing models modules yet. So when we when we started, we don't have that good a confidence, but we build confidence confidence later, and then we can flip the current one on the in the delivered software to use the everything new. So these kind of market tests are like usually a month long. Uh, we instruct the stores to just use the machine as normal and then our people testers and technical product managers will monitor the machines through an online service that we have back office system so we have things like measurements or error situations and figuring out what the current status and gives us logs when everything goes bad and such so unit tests sadly there were none like you said, in terms of tests, we have no tests, which was <laughs> kind of just the reality for a kind of legacy system. To say that the firmware and these kind of things is probably like 10 years of history in these kind of things in different modules. So the initial architecture didn't really support having unit tests, so there weren't any. And then you update the code and then you cannot add and then it just stayed that way but we do have some now so <laughs> if since we cannot just add unit tests we need some kind of safety net around the thing so we go one level up and we do module tests and these are our pride and joy uh, this is the primary reason for this talk is we have these kind of racks uh, these are normal server racks uh, but we have uh, both intact modules in there and we have standalone circuit boards in there and we ha now have a, like a thousand tests that run and just checks actual physical components for some desired behavior so we run these manually or we can run them nightly we run them incrementally on each new 
uh, checking of the source code and we build and also on reviews so basically my pride and joy our pride and joy so it's kind of like black box testing for the complete modules so uh, these kind of things run in like 10 minutes for the review builds or the incremental i think so it's fairly fast enough i think but when we have these kind of module tests we can now refactor the code and then add unit tests as well like because we have the safety net we can refactor and be sure that we probably catch a lot of the things in here so the contents of the rack is like we have a pc we have a network switch we have some serial to ethernet like to telnet port uh, converters we have power converters to deliver 24 volts to the boards we have power switches on relay so that we can physically yank the power to all the things we have usb to can adapters so that we can talk to the boards on can from the pc we have pull-out trays like below sorry you can't see and then you some we also have some webcams so I can see that the boards actually physically move if we want to but it's primarily used while you're developing the test and you see that oh yeah it blinks it blinks with the right speed and kind of things very useful when you are sitting at home but everything here is in the office so, or you're sitting at your desk with your fan, all your monitors and set of it's okay and, but all this is in a lab somewhere so we started with one cabinet we're currently about five and it wouldn't surprise me if we double that by the summer next year uh, we continually just add more tests for the current modules we add more modules <laughs> because we have to start adding the modules we haven't decided to replace yet <laughs> because that's the whole thing the, we started saying we have to replace like one then it was three or four then it was six and by last week it was eight <laughs> different kind of modules so it's a new normal that new modules will always come we are also in the process of adding jtag the connected modules those will be exploded modules uh, with the standalone sports so that we can more automatically test like bootloaders and faulty upgrades and stuff but our primary use at first which is we have the module as is and then you update it over the normal update over can as the reverse vending machine would have done itself so yeah we started with one cabinet it was like let's just try this out the engineering more or less forced its way through and say we have to have this and the unforeseen benefits are, let's say, unforeseen to some, but we do now have a very detailed behavioral ex a description of each module in this test, this test track. And it's just not for the uh, developers, but it also for the system designers. So they can now know that this one has a quirk that if you calibrate it to within plus minus like 80, 90 degrees, then it stores its calibration position but if you don't then it loses its calibration calibrated position when you reboot the nodes so these kind of there are some funky things uh, that all have that all the engineering or the developers just know <laughs> because of course it's always been that way but when you have some new system designers uh, they cannot find the documentation then and you can't it's not feasible to just run around and ask the entire department so essentially we get the spec we always should have had that was the shortcut that we took so now we have to backtrack on that <laughs> in a sense we have an executable spec which is kind of fun <laughs> in a sense um, we re re reuse the can implementation or the logic for up uh, upgrading and downgrading and flashing and communicating over the proprietary protocol on can uh, f from our reverse vending machines the actual software which uh, f happily enough found bugs in our actual other parts of the system and then we had to improve the architecture because we have to slice off the kind of implicit dependencies that it had on like it knows whether it is 
what kind of machines it was, but now it is, it isn't a vending machine. It is just a standalone thing. So it improved the architecture. This isolated quite a bit more the actual implementation for this. And a fun side effect is we bought the cabinets that had a lock on it, key and lock, because we think that's usually good to have. Suddenly we, we have to move these to a place where they, uh, a lot of people can reach them, but it was mostly helpful because someone, some engineer just borrowed a module from the, te from the test track and like all the tests failed <laughs> and like, oh, okay, this is bad. And we just locked, <laughs> lock the doors and place the key on one of our uh, developers desks like everybody knew it was there but some you have to like physically go get it in order to steal it and like that's just a little bit of a an hindrance and then it, that stopped <laughs> but now everybody's learned to know they're all open all the time so uh, these module tests are used by our review system uh, we do, one of the things we decided to do was to review every change related to this activity, like everything, because we, we don't want to lose that common knowledge in the teams. So we have to want to everyone to have a look at it. So the review is built for all different kind of modules. It, yeah, every module. Uh, you run all the unit tests, the few we had, yeah, hopefully increasing. Then we run module tests in the rack. So this takes like 10 minutes, but that's fast enough because you can do what I call CI driven development. Like you have, you develop on one or two boards and then see, oh, it probably works. Create a review, don't send it to anyone yet, but then you just wait for the results because then it's run on like, a thousand tests on 20 boards in different configurations and stuff. And then after that, you can do the normal review behavior and see that we're probably good on this check, this commit. So this helps us catch bugs even before they are committed into the source. So this has all given us what I like to think of as confidence and velocity. We do have a very much increased confidence in what ever it is we do the conference in the code and everything but it also gives us velocity because it's like we we know the direction we're going and this guides us in the, that direction so uh, if my personal belief is like these kind of the racks we created it's like one of the most important development things we've done in the last five years so that's the high level and then probably one of some people like to know some details internally Everything is C++ with a uh, slight footnote. It just started in C, of course, as everything. Uh, but we are moving to make everything C++. I don't know. So this, the technology, we try to keep things boring with little less than dependencies. We have an uh, in-house uh, protocol that wraps can. Uh, and then we use FreeRTOS and we use some link time uh, abstractions for some functions and we use abstract base classes for like C++ -ish things. We decided on virtual functions because they are very easy to teach. Uh, everyone knows them and they are usually fast enough. If they're not fast enough, you have measurements and then you do something else, I guess. Uh, we haven't hit that yet, so <laughs> fast enough. Uh, we rewrote the old build system from uh, GNU Make into CMake because we use CMake for the other parts of the system and let's just focus on one technology. So we are kind of, uh, we worry a lot, I think, with external dependencies and stuff, but I'm still unsure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, but we try to use like known tools, boring tools, uh, techniques that everyone knows. Uh, part of this is also we acknowledge that our engineers know different kind of things. They have different skills. They have different levels of proficiency in C++ at least. So we try to keep things uh, as far away from the quiz last night as possible. So. <laughs> 
the high level is like uh, most modules we've decided to use the same binary image in flash uh, primarily because we do bulk can do bulk loading over can and the can is not a particularly fast bus uh, and when you have to transfer like 100k it it is a significant speed of when you have like 50 nodes that you have to update uh, the downside of this is, of course, that we have to do a runtime switch on which kind of module we are. Uh, so this kind of board type is persisted in uh, during production checkout. It writes to some uh, persistent storage, and then we can use that at runtime. Uh, so another thing is then the image has to fit on all boards. So we are kind of limited on functionality, but it hasn't hit us yet. And when that happens, we probably just give the 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 modules that need all the flash data they have. They will probably get a separate binary image, and then we get some of the benefits of bulk loading, but not completely. Uh, one of the things our bootloader waits for a start on the canvas. So the, when the modules come up, they just say, "Hey, I'm waiting," and then the machine says, "Hey, yeah, go start." Uh, the both bootloader can also flash image in the case of you get a faulty, uh, faulty image, and we do also have double image in flash just to able to go back and forth if need be. Very rarely do we need it. So the link time platform abstraction is what Kate Gregory mentioned in her keynote yesterday. It's with that we move the logic, we move the work for, into the build system. Uh, we have these kind of pure functions and then the build system will add uh, an implementation for that that's specific for these the mcu that we're working on building for sorry so we try to move away from if def uh, if defs and all as much as possible because it's it gets hard to track when you have like triple nested and <laughs> kind of stuff so of course there are tons of improvements we could do we just go step by step here like irq number could probably be a class same as we could have a pin that do everything uh, the lead could have been a separate class and stuff and all the things we can do now that we have the tests to catch all our bugs Uh, yeah, uh, we also use uh, base classes, abstract base classes, usually with pure virtual functions like this. Uh, of course, for us, we had a lot of existing uh, classes that do stuff like an angle sensor and a counter and analog to digital conversion and stuff. Uh, part of what you do is just extract an interface from that and you have these kind of things and then we'll get to work on improving this like adding a separate uh, rpm type instead of just using floats bunch of things we can do differently of course mm. uh, since we have runtime switch on the module type we have the case that we have uh, currently we have three versions of this <laughs> As we have this kind of thing in three different uh, MCUs, but we want them to have the common setup. We want to guarantee that it all, they all have the analog, the digital conversions and stuff. So what, the pattern we use here is we have a yeah, templated factory function essentially. Uh, so. These are the three boards for this stepper assembly. We have the the code essentially boils down to you come to a point in main that you say, I know my board type, and then there's a switch. And in each switch case, there is one entry, like right? stepper assembly of board 527, create that one. Uh, we do have, then we have this uh, template type template argument named board and we have information from that board like there are slight differences between everything because uh, 
you find improvements that you could have and like you have this kind this is our old, oldest one i think and then the engineer uh, electrical engineers and stuff they have a list of like we know this is kind of we wish we had fixed this this and this and this and so the the modules aren't completely the same but they are interchangeable at but to a maximum degree but they also have some extra by just necessity so the hope was that this kind of function will more easily show you what the differences are between all the ones that have what is the same for all the modules and what is the differences when you have a different mcu so here for example you some have safety input some have you have to know which kind of pins on the chip we have connected the motor onto uh, some of them have different uh, places where they put the idle lead that was a fun one and that is also a runtime where we have to figure out which revision of the boards has the idle lead at this position like which kind of rotary encoder does the board have because that one also had to be replaced uh, some argument does it have an inverted like is it mounted upside down by some error or something no i think so uh what's fun of this is like we've st we've, we've added this for every new module we touch and we, like a week ago or two I overheard someone to say, like, we don't have started on the new module yet, but we've already created this factory function. <laughs> like, so we have it ready for a lot of the modules that we know we're going to change. One of the things here, uh, the sens get sensor type, which kind of rotary encoder we use. Uh, we have not just, we not just know, but some of them have uh runtime no uh, it has a resistor on the board that says whether it's the one or the other so then we have to read a pin in order to figure out which rotary encoder we use and that we can use like fun normal function overloading in c plus plus to take either you have that detection pin or you have or you know the, uniquely which one you already have so you can have this kind of uh, if it chooses which one of these based on what the structs of the board actually defines it's, it's kind of fun and it's it boils down to nothing essentially <laughs> because most of these are can be ever everything that is has safety but it's probably a static context for a variable so it that one would just evaluate to no for this one perhaps Fun things, uh, yeah. Of course, it's slightly protected to <laughs> protect the innocent there. Uh, one of the fun things we also have is we have panicking. Uh, sometimes you get hard faults, you get weird desertion failures, and like when that happens, the best thing for an MCU for an embed system is just for these kinds at least. We don't want to recover; we just want to go per go down and just send back to the machine hey things went awry i'm now at the start get me up to speed again you can send like the panic reason and you get like backtrace plus the current rtos track uh, task and all the active interrupts and fault registers so that one gets logs and it gets sent if if it happens in the field and then we can get all of these things when the bug is reported like a week later usually <laughs> This is just a section in the linker trip. Uh, we define some area of the memory that this kind of data resides in while you're doing a soft reboot. One of the things we use here is like a macro or that's as built in unreachable. You can also have functions marked as uh, no return. And that tells the compiler to like, this one would never return and then would optimize it slightly better and it you avoid having to create some return zero or something afterwards because the compiler knows it can. Whenever you comes to here, ever, I'm dead after it. Uh, this kind of code is a snapshot in time. 
and there are a lot of improvements, but we have to choose our battles, I guess. So we are working continuously on making the base architecture easier to explain and better. So it's only been a year since we've done this, uh, which is weird to think about now. It's only been one year and we've replaced like six complete modules now, I think. Uh, we do seem to tend towards more and more classes just for isolation and compartmentalization and better modularization, I guess. Uh, it do make it easier to understand dependencies and I feel that's one of the big benefits of C++. And uh, hopefully it likely makes it easier to use in unit tests instead of having to manually add the function that it doesn't that is missing and you avoid kind of global state as much as you can so there is an internal discussion of whether to use like uh, uh, parts the specific factory functions like create me an adc uh, and a digital converter or whether we just want to create that one in main and pass the reference around We'll figure that out, I guess, probably will be influenced by the unit test. And uh, my personal stance is that for this kind of system, main is the factory function. That's everything. Main is the only factory functions you need. But we are curious about other projects like LibHAL, which are uh, primarily authored by Khalil Estel, uh, development for his in the university course where they use free artos very much like us. And that one provides uh, ready interfaces for uh, pins and registers and SPI and stuff. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel there. We'll see whether we go for it or not. Again, it's only been a year. So again, confidence and velocity. We build our safety nets in order to give us confidence and uh, ease and or peace. We want calm engineers, so anything you can help them avoid, like having multiple thoughts, usually helps. So now the survival, we do have new modules, they work. They have very few bugs, uh, remarkably, uh, not remarkably, as expected. <laughs> uh, so now the production of for our machines have alternatives. We know we are no longer single so single source, and we have like it does cost something. It does cost cost to have multiple sourcing and it, multiple production lines and stuff. But it's maybe the better way in the world that we see now. So we now can continue to create reverse vending machines which is good because then we get money and then I get to work, still work where I work, which is good. Yes, it's good. I work well. <laughs> money P keeps coming in. Business lessons. Uh, but it isn't just that. We have the survival continues. <laughs> we are not done. Uh, many had hoped we were done, that this kind of shortage would be over, but it's not. Uh, not only is the components shorting, but you also have shortages on actual manpower in productions in like China, at least in Shenzhen and wherever where they have. Con the, the COVID epidemic is still ongoing, very much so. But we continue to survive. We have a stable th team. We have people that work exclusive, more or less exclusively on this. They get their quiet time. They get their attention on the right place. And but we also have enough people to cover some distractions. So because distractions will happen, so you have to have enough people to cover some of that. We have significant knowledge sharing within the department. Before we had like two people that worked on this code base, like they only part time on this code base. And now we have like five people working on continuously while this project is ongoing. But now we, we are much calmer about what we can safely know about the system and do changes in the future. 
uh, thankfully now management recognizes the importance of these module tests and module rack. We no longer have to <laughs> beg on our knees for a new one. We just say we need a new one and then we get it more or less. Uh, the module rack is basically praised by everyone. <laughs> uh, I love them, we love them. Uh, the modules keep happening. Uh, when the deadline for this presentation was, I think we had like four or five. And then before summer, when I primarily worked on this, they had seven. And last week we decided to do two more. So the survival continues. But it's, it's interesting to note that the delivery is very predictable. Uh, for every module we take, we redesign, it takes five months, five or six months from when we start to it's uh, ready to be mass produced. And then mass producing means sourcing and supply has also had a month or two to figure out all the supply lines in. But I looked at all of them and they, they all fit in like five or six months. And like the development, and uh, as I said earlier, the market tests are one month. And if it's uh, sourcing and supply as one to two months, and then you have some extra internal system testing, like development is like three months for one of these things. So it's remarkably stable. So, but yeah, the survival isn't over. This is more or less a new normal. But we are ready for that now. We know what to do. So we have introduced calm enthusiasm within the group. We keep going and everything, but we're still calm. We aren't stressed. Uh, this isn't su survival. It's, it's for people, it's for us. It's okay, we are the actual humans in the system here. <laughs> we have to be happy, we have to do good work and we have to make it so that we are thriving. And I've witnessed this firsthand, like all these safety nets that's, they make it easier to talk about, to make it easier to reason about the system. And like, you aren't afraid to break anything because, hey, breaks happen. Like every day we have, okay, this test started failing nightly. Like, okay, is it a problem with the test rack or is it an actual bug? But hey, it's it's everyday thing. And it's imp I like to just say that I despise the word stress. <laughs> For me, it actually is like, uh, if, for me, it means destruction, and if uh, if you choose to think that stress can be positive, I encourage you to think of a different word, <laughs> please. Because stress, to me, I associate it with like bridges, and if a bridge is under stress, it collapses. It You destroy some joints, and it is actually a destructive work. So yeah, go steady and get forwarding, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, do come work with me. We are, of course, every day, every day <laughs> looking for other people, more co-workers, as I think everyone is. Uh, special thanks for all to work for encouraging me to do this, <laughs> pushing me. I've been extremely nervous these two, two days, but it's better now. Uh, of course, thanks to my friends and also thanks to my mom for this amazing story. Uh, I love this. Any questions? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, we don't have so many developers that that's needed. Uh, the question was uh, whether we have to have time slotting in order to test our stuff on the rack. Uh, we do have some parts of the rack that are uh, reserved for just manual work, uh, but we also have, uh, when we can disable the tests, and run, but we are like five or six people that work on it, so we usually just talk together and like, uh, arrange that. Oh yeah, how fast we do board bring up. Um, uh, some of these can be pretty fun. <laughs> uh, we had some, uh, one example of this was that we had uh, a board that we are ready for and when from it arrives on the desk of the developer to it was working, it was 30 minutes. 
<laughs> and then it mostly worked. There were, of course, some bugs, but it was mostly working and it come up and it talk everything because we had uh, all the frame, uh, the rest of the stuff working on a different board. So it's very little. And if it was this one, uh, you you had all the parts correctly. You had all the parts implemented for the old way. And then as long as you did the small uh, platform specific things correctly, then it magically appears. So like, I think on average, it's like a day for bring up for us. Yeah. So you said the automation and computing happened. Yes. Uh, the question was whether we have considered using device trees, yeah, uh, or some other way to set. The... the answer is we haven't gone that far yet. I think uh, we focusing on the car as it is and working towards. But I can envision a future that we try to use this more constructively or more declaratively. I thought I'd leave you with some fun bugs we have found during this. Um, we had one kind of uh, device that when you try to use two of the outputs as PVM, it just said no, but we didn't know why. We didn't know it was a bug or if it wasn't, but it's un but it's, we used, but it was because of a hardware timer that was used, was shared between two outputs. <laughs> that was fun. Uh, we had the RVM going into an infinite loop if a module refused a bulk upgrade. <laughs> that was luckily catched in the tests. Uh, we were reading wrong memory once. <laughs> Hopefully, thankfully, it was just where we're printing some version. So <laughs> that was, I think that one was caught by uh, our, our system test, our tester. Uh, production checkout failed once because we changed the command line output slightly. Once we added OX before hex des hex number, and then it broke. So <laughs> okay. So we're slightly aware about that. Uh, the funnest one I think was that we had some, we have some, uh, the belt that are in the front of the machine that first grabs this bottle that had to violate communication link uh, between the actual boards that run and the, send, uh, some docking underneath. That commutation dropped after exactly 21 minutes and 24 seconds every time. <laughs> And uh, we only caught it by looking at the logs because the logs said, oh, I lost communication with the, uh, with the infeed, with the device. And then it just restarts and comes up again. And then it's up ready in like um, uh, a second or two. <laughs> but then you inspected the logs and said, hey, I lost it after 21 minutes and 24 seconds at least. And then every time, I'm like, okay, it turned out to be uh, a, a compensation for uh, some frequency modulation that just drifted ever so slightly off by one every 10 milliseconds and then it reached uh, yeah in uh, short max or something and then died and then <laughs> rebooted <laughs> funny kind of things but still very happy with the work we've done question Uh, yes, we do have hardware and software watchdogs. And when the hardware or, was, or software watchdog triggers, then it causes a panic. And then we record that and we communicate that. Well. So we catch a lot of things, those kind of things, hardware faults and stuff. We try to catch everything. Out of time. Thank you all very much. <laughs>